All right. Well, thanks very much, Alvaro, uh, and thanks for that uh, very nice introduction. I already feel like I'm going to let you down a little bit because I wasn't actually going to speak about uh, the cursed curve, even though I will briefly mention it uh, later on. Uh, but so, but thanks very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to speak here, and I have to say I've very much enjoyed uh, all of the talks so far. So thanks very much for for having me at this event. So today I would like to say a few words about um, joint work with Henri Darmon, where we introduce an analog of singular moduli, which are a key role player uh, in the so-called CM theory, theory of complex multiplication. But we're finding analogs in the setting of real quadratic fields. And so I wanted to discuss this a little bit today, uh, as well as report on some progress towards fleshing out this uh, new RM theory, uh, which is joint work with Darmon and also with Alice Pozzi and Yunkum. I'll be talking about various things. And um, since I'm the last speaker also, I'll, I'll sort of try and adapt a very informal tone in this talk. And so in particular, you should feel free to interrupt at any time uh, with any questions you might have during the talk or afterwards, that's, that's all the same. One thing I should say is that I have kind of full screen. My slides is the only thing I can see. So I, I unfortunately can't keep an eye on the chat uh, or on any of your videos. So if anything's going on, uh, do interrupt me and do let me know via audio. All right, so I wanna say a few things. And so uh, I wanna first dwell a little bit on CM theory, the theory of complex multiplication. Um, before I move on to this RM theory, maybe theory should be in quotation marks as it will become clear later on in this talk. And in the middle, I'll talk about something that seems sort of bizarrely out of place. I'll talk about linking numbers of knots, uh, which seems a priori that has nothing to do with the CM theory. I will have just talked about them, but it provides an important motivation and indeed some of the mechanical constructions that go into our RM theory. But I'd like to begin with discussing uh, CM theory. And uh, I wanna start with the following observation. So for experts on CM theory, this will feel a little bit cliche and unoriginal to start with this. Uh, but in, in my defense, it's my understanding that there's a lot of students in the audience um, who, who might not have seen this before. So I'd just like to briefly mention this. There is this famous observation, which is very often attributed to Ramanujan, which is the following. It says that if you take the exponential of pi times the square root of 163, you get something, all of these things are irrational numbers, but you get something that looks very much like an integer. If you were working on a calculator that only had a couple of digits of decimal precision, you would actually think it's exactly an integer. So this is kind of a curious fact, right? Because there doesn't seem to be a good reason for such an expression to be so close to an integer. Uh, the first thing to mention is that it's not actually an integer. So I put enough decimal places for you to see that after 12 decimal places, suddenly you see something coming up that's not a nine. So it's very, very close to an integer, but it's not actually uh, an integer. Now, uh, this attribution to Ramanujan, I learned this morning, actually, when I was working on my slides, I looked it up. It's actually a wrong attribution. So the, the real story of this observation is um, Martin Gardner, who's a journalist who wrote a lot about mathematics in 1973, published uh, an article uh, on April Fool's Day, so the 1st of April, stating that this was exactly an integer and attributing this to Ramanujan. Uh, whereas Ramanujan did work on very similar things, so values of the exponential function of irrationalities, he didn't seem to have observed exactly this, but it's the sort of thing we imagine he could have easily observed. So let's just uh, roll with it, keeping in mind that it's actually an April Fool's joke, this attribution. All right, so there's actually a very satisfactory explanation of the fact that this is so close to an integer. And the answer comes from a bit of an unexpected angle. It comes from uh, the theory of modular forms. In particular here, it comes from the theory of complex multiplication, where a key role is played by the so-called J function. So the J invariant is a holomorphic function on the upper half plane, which has a polar affinity. And it has the following Q expansion. It's a modular form of weight zero, by which I mean in particular uh, and it's holomorphic in the upper half plane, and it satisfies this transformation law uh, with respect to elements of SL2Z. Okay, so this function has come up many, many, many times uh, during this conference. And one thing that's very interesting about it is that the values of this function at arguments which lie in an imaginary quadratic field are extremely interesting and rich numbers. So these values we call singular moduli. Now, singular moduli are known by uh, the theory of complex multiplication to always be algebraic numbers. And in fact, they're even algebraic integers. And, and I've listed a couple of examples here for you. If you haven't seen this before. So for instance, the J invariant 
of i, the square root of minus one in the upper half plane, is equal to 1728. And this is um, known to all of you, at least in the form of the password for these meetings. So I feel like I don't have to further justify this. So more interesting singular modulus come up when you take, for instance, the j invariant of the square root of minus five. That j invariant is an algebraic number, but it lies in a quadratic extension of q. And here you see which one it is. So it lies in q adjoined the square root of five. Now, I'd just like to point out, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this, this square root of five here, uh, that's not a typo. That shouldn't be a square root of minus five, which is what I have here. So it's kind of striking, right? We get this value and it seems to be relate, in a closely related algebraic extension, but it's a real algebraic extension. Uh, the same thing happens with j uh, square root of minus 14. That is actually an algebraic number of degree four. So it satisfies a degree four polynomial over q. And here it is in uh, explicit expression using radicals. So already this little table puts me to shame because the j of square root of minus 14, that's an example that was computed by Weber entirely by hand before computers existed. And I confess that j of square root of minus five, I computed and I used a computer to do it. So uh, these things, uh, people used to be very skilled at them uh, at one time and uh, could sort of uh, come up with these explicit expressions. Here, I just want to use them as an illustration of what the type of thing is that you might expect in general. Okay, so always algebraic integers, which already is a fantastic miracle, right? We have this uh, analytic function, the j invariant. There's no a priori reason that it should take algebraic values at certain algebraic arguments, but in fact it does, and that's what uh, CM theory tells. So in fact, let's focus on this middle line in this example, and let's explore in the language of uh, Pete Clark's talk from the first day of this, uh, this conference, what happens if we fix this extension, q adjoint square root of minus five, but we evaluate the j function and elements in this extension of larger and larger uh, conductor, larger and larger discriminants. So for those of you who were at Pete Clark's talk on the first day, this is a picture I stole from Drew Sutherland uh, of one of these isogeny volcanoes. This is one way to visualize what we're doing. This j of square root of minus five maybe sits somewhere on the top of this volcano. And then as we descend deeper and deeper and deeper into the volcano, we get these values that lie in larger and larger and larger extensions uh, of Q of larger and larger degree. So if you don't remember about these volcanoes, it doesn't really matter. You can just think of, for instance, if I take the J invariant of square root of minus five, we saw that it generates Q adjoint square root of five. But if you take multiples of it, like twice the square root of minus five, or maybe four times or eight times or 16 times, so we keep increasing that, we get numbers in larger and larger and larger extensions. So the, the volcanoes are sort of a way to visualize that if you take just increasing powers of one prime. All right, so in fact, uh, we can be a little bit more precise about this. These larger and larger fields that we're uh, generating, in fact, are the, the interesting part of the explicit class field theory of imaginary quadratic fields. And here's a, here's a theorem, which is part of the main statement of uh, the theory of complex multiplication, which says that all finite abelian extensions of K I didn't include this in the statement, but it should say K is imaginary quadratic here, yeah, are essentially generated by these special values of the J function, the singular moduli, as well as also the roots of unity. So if you have both of these, you can generate essentially all the extensions. And here essentially is up to taking some square roots. There are some small square roots that you're missing in this picture, but they're essentially all the extensions. So these individual extensions that we get, um, the, the ring class fields, uh, that's what they're called, which are obtained from K, the imaginary quadratic field, by adjoining these special values of the J function, we understand very well. We understand their structure very well. Uh, and in particular, we understand also the Galois action on these singular moduli, because it's true that if you act by Galois on a singular modulus, you get another singular modulus in a way that's very precise, and that often goes by the name of Shimura reciprocity. All right, so these statements are, are quite classical and um, they were originally used uh, to prove many, many uh, theorems and statements and conjectures that were at the time open that seemingly have maybe nothing to do with the J environment. For instance, there was Euler's conjecture. There's this big problem of if you have a prime, you want to decide, you want to come up with some criterion to show that it's of the form X squared plus NY squared for some N. In analogy with what Fermat proved that a prime is of the form X squared plus Y squared if and only if it's one mod four, if you increase this n, you find that often you, you can't come up with the same type of criterion. And here, there was something that was conjectured by Euler, but he was not able to prove during his lifetime. Uh, 
this was the late uh, 18th century, he conjectured this. He said that P prime is of the form X squared plus 27Y squared, if and only if um, P is either, sorry, is both one mod three and two is a cube root modulo P. Okay, so you have these two kind of conditions that characterize when P is of that form, which was sort of a spectacular application at the time. And in the language um, of these uh, ring class fields, really what's being said here is that these two criteria sort of reflect the fact that if you take the ring class field of conductor three of Q adjoined to square root of minus three, you get a dihedral extension of Q of uh, degree six. And so this dihedral structure results in these two pieces to the criterion in a way that I don't want to be too precise about now. I just want to point out that these, this theory had many uh, applications um, that seemingly have nothing to do with this problem. Okay. So uh, one other interesting thing about, uh, about these singular moduli is that we can say exactly when they are integer. So a singular modulus is going to be an integer. And of course, we know it's always an algebraic integer. Here I mean an honest integer, so an algebraic integer in Q. If and only if the argument, the uh, imaginary quadratic number that we um, fed into the J environment generates an order of class number one. So the order Z uh, um, um, generated by this tau has unique factorization. In other words, uh, we will get an integer singular modulus. Okay. And what's striking about this is that there's in fact a finite list of integer singular moduli. Uh, and so here is almost the entire finite list. I've only put the ones for which we get an order that's actually the maximal order in an imaginary quadratic field for general ones without this maximal condition. There's maybe two or three extra ones. But the point is that there's a finite list and we can find all of them explicitly and we can show that there are no other um, singular moduli that are actually integers. So what this table is showing us here is uh, I'm restricting myself to maximal orders. If I look at any of these fields on the left, all of these have class number one. So the rings of integers have unique factorization. Now, uh, there's this elliptic curve, this has already uh, been mentioned in many other talks, that has CM by a maximal order. Um, and I've put here the equations also for these CM elliptic curves. If you take their J invariance, which is the same as the singular modulus attached to the situation, you get the numbers on the right. And for your convenience, I have factorized them. So they're, they're quite large, they're really big numbers. But if you factorize them, you notice this very curious thing, namely, that they only seem to be divisible by very, very small primes and with kind of exciting large exponents. So that's, that's already kind of striking fact about uh, singular moduli in the case of their integers. And already we're now in a good position to explain this uh, observation we have on the first slide. Because you see, the last entry in this table is Q joined the square root of minus 163. And that corresponds to that huge number here on the right which is two to the 18, three to the cubed, five cubed, 23 cubed, 29 cubed with a minus sign. So that's a, a huge integer. Uh, and that's what this integer is when I write it out in full. That's this big number here on the left of the displayed equation. That is the J invariant of one plus the square root of minus 163 over two. Now the J invariant also has this Q expansion, which I showed on the first slide, which tells me that that J invariant is equal to minus the number we were interested in, plus 744, plus a bunch of other numbers, which are powers of Q, which are powers of this uh, uh, argument, so e to the two pi i, where z is this number in here. And so it's easy to see that these numbers, Q to a positive exponent, are extremely small. They're very, very small numbers. So there's some sort of error term, and this error term here, this very small number, it's essentially zero up to like 12, you need 12 digits of precision to see that it's not zero. And this completely explained what we saw on the first slide, because you see that quantity we have now is equal to some integer plus something that's almost zero. And that's why we got this number to be so close to uh, an actual integer. All right, so this sort of explains this observation we have on the first slide. Uh, and there are many other beautiful applications of CM theory, uh, which I've mentioned some, I've omitted many, many more. Uh, and so CM theory was sort of uh, regarded as a, as a big triumph, but it was also regarded as something that was kind of finished. So it had reached some sort of conclusion in the early 20th century and people were very happy with it. It was aesthetically pleasing as a theory and it seemed like there wasn't really much more to be gotten from this. So this remained so for many decades until uh, Gross and Zagier in the early 80s got their hands on this theory. 
and showed that there was much more left to be discovered about singular moduli, and in fact transformed all these kind of algebraic uh, things that I've talked about now into what is today still one of the best pieces of progress towards the Birch and Swinage and Dyer conjecture. Okay, so uh, observe, for instance, that if you take the difference of two of these singular moduli, these are the two biggest numbers that I put on that table on the previous slide. I get this number, 2 to 15, 3 cubed, blah, 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 plus this other number, both of which are very smooth, meaning they're, they're not divisible by any large prime factor. Now, what Gross and Zaghi observed is that if you take their difference, you get the following number. Now, that number is still very, very smooth. It's only divisible by very small prime factors compared to the size of this integer. And so um, this looks very bizarre, right? Because there's this conjecture, uh, the ABC conjecture, which says that, in fact, you shouldn't really be allowed to do this very often. You shouldn't be allowed to add two smooth numbers and get another smooth number. That's sort of the gist of what the ABC conjecture tells us. And so this would seem kind of bizarre. Luckily, we're, of course, saved by the fact that there are only finitely many class number one orders. So the finiteness of that list here tells us that we can't really violate ABC. We would need lots and lots and lots of such uh, smooth numbers so that if we add them up, we get another smooth number. And so luckily, we do not disprove the ABC conjecture with this, even though it is kind of striking. You should be very exceptional. All right, so one thing to mention, uh, this finite list, so the statement that it's finite and finding uh, which class number one orders exactly there are is known as the class number one problem. So this was solved uh, by Hegner um, sort of before uh, World War II. And he, um, he had this proof, which was sort of not really accepted in the community. And it wasn't until the 60s that Brian Birch discovered that actually his proof was valid. It was just sort of written in a style that people couldn't make sense of it. And there were some gaps maybe that needed filling in. Now, in modern terminology, as was pointed out by Serre, you could phrase Hegner's solution as saying that he was actually finding all the integral points on a certain modular curve. And that modular curve is a non-split Cartan modular curve of level 24, which happens to be an elliptic curve in this case. And so what Hegner really does in this language is he was finding all the integral points on this elliptic curve. And Serre also observed that if you, if you find all the rational points, say, on any non-split Cartan modular curve, say, of prime level, then you, you get a new uh, proof of the class number one problem. And so I, I just want to briefly mention that it's kind of amusing. You can also use the non-split Cartan level 13 curve, that's this cursed curve that Alvaro mentioned. Um, uh, and if you find all its rational points, which is a much harder task here because it's the genus three rank three curve, then you get a new proof of um, the class number one formula. So, so this was done in, in joint work with uh, Jennifer Balakrishna, Nathan Dobra, Stefan Müller, and Jan Teitman. Now, okay, so you'll probably think, wow, that's a pretty flimsy excuse to, to mention this work. And in many ways, you would be right. But I have another point I want to make by, by mentioning this, is that what we do is, in some sense, uh, owes a lot to the work of Gross and Zagier. So we use the theopiatic heights uh, in this particular Diophantine problem of finding all the rational points on a genus 3 curve. And this theopiatic heights, of course, I mean, owes much of its existence to all the developments that happened after the 80s, after Gross and Zagier published their work because what they were really doing is they were computing uh, height pairings, Archimedean height pairings between Hegner points. And this led to tremendous activity and tremendous development, uh, which have led to all of these tools that go into uh, our proof. So there's a kind of a philosophical connection also with the breakthrough of Gross and Zagier. And it's an illustration of how their work was really so influential that it has ramifications far, far, far beyond what uh, they probably originally foresaw. So it's very influential work of Gross and Zagier. A second remark, which I'd like to note, is that, you see, I told you I was going to talk about real quadratic singular moduli. And for real quadratic singular moduli, in fact, we expect, uh, by a famous conjecture of Gauss, that many of them should have class number one. There's a finite list. There should be an infinite list of uh, uh, real quadratic fields with class number one. So it would seem that maybe if we had a theory exactly like we had in the CM case, we would necessarily violate ABC. So keep that in mind uh, in what follows when I talk about RM theory and see if you can see why we don't uh, contradict ABC. All right, so I just want to say a few words. Uh, okay, so speed up a little bit. Um, so uh, about the work of Gross and Zagier, about what the ingredients are that go into it. So if we take two CM points, that's what they do. They don't look at a singular singular modulus, but a, a difference of them. 
Now that's always an algebraic integer. And if we take its norm all the way down to Q, we get an actual honest integer. Okay. And so what Gross and Zagier do is they find an explicit formula for this integer. And this integer, they approach in two different ways. So it's interesting in their proof, they give actually two proofs um, of this explicit formula for that integer. And the first proof is algebraic and it uses crucially um, CM elliptic curves. So theory of complex multiplication for elliptic curves. And it shows using this theory of elliptic curves that in fact, they can analyze it sort of prime by prime. They can say this integer, it's Q at evaluation, which is the largest power of Q that divides it, is given in terms of some entirely algebraic description. So embeddings of imaginary quadratic fields into some definite quaternion algebra um, ramified at infinity in Q. So a purely algebraic description, it doesn't matter so much what it is. So, but the point is this uses uh, CM theory. Then they also give a second proof, which is a, a completely analytic proof. Um, this proof goes by calculating the Fourier coefficient of a certain real analytic family of Eisenstein series over a real quadratic field. So to tell you roughly where this is situated, we have two CM fields, Q tau one, Q tau two, two imaginary quadratic extensions. They generate some biquadratic extension over Q and intermediate in there is a real quadratic field, which I'll call F. And that character that cuts out this biquadratic extension, I'll call chi. All right, so their starting point is the work of Hecke uh, from the 1920s, who wrote down a family in terms of some parameter S uh, in two variables. So it's a, it's a modular form but in two variables. So it's a much fancier object um, than, than, for instance, this J invariant, which is a modular form in one variable. Here we have two variables and really also a third one, which is this family, this S variable. Uh, I don't want to tell you too precisely what it is. Here, here it is. It's a very explicit definition. Uh, it's a big infinite sum of some elementary expressions. Okay? It's a family of modular forms. And roughly there are several steps in their proof, which again, you can sort of phase out if this doesn't interest you. I'm not going to really use it. Just want to give you an idea of what goes into it. What they do is they take this family in two variables and they set the variables to be equal to each other. That's called the diagonal restriction. And they show that as S goes to zero in this family, this diagonal restriction goes to zero identically. So you get some sort of Q expansion, all of whose coefficients are functions of S, and as S approaches zero, they all vanish. So you get an identical vanishing of this diagonal restriction. What Gross and Zagier do then is they say, well, if it vanishes, let's take the first order derivative of this family with respect to S. This is the leading term in the Taylor expansion of this family. And let's take that at that point S equals zero. This gives us some real analytic um, modular form of which we can take the so-called holomorphic projection to get an actual honest modular form out. By computing this explicitly, and this is really quite uh, an achievement, uh, just explicit computations, they relate the Fourier coefficients to the log of this integer that we're looking for, which is the norm of the differences of singular moduli. The final step is to note that this modular form that they've cooked up, it's a weight two holomorphic modular form of level one. And therefore, it must be zero. By abstract reasons, we know that that space only contains zero, and therefore, this holomorphic projection must, in fact, vanish identically. This gives them their formula in a purely analytic way. And you know, you're free to feel free to forget about all of these steps that I just told you. One thing that's very striking about this is that it does not use CM elliptic curves. This is important because in the real multiplication story that comes later on, there are no elliptic curves anymore. So we have to somehow rely on other methods. All right, so anyway, so how am I doing on time? Yeah, I'm not so good. So um, let me just very briefly say something about linking numbers of knots. Uh, and this seemingly has nothing to do with what I talked about so far. I'll just use it as inspiration and some of the constructions that go into it will go into our construction later on. So the starting point is now uh, something very different is that the fact that if you take SL2R and you quotient out by SL2Z, which is a kind of a discrete subgroup in there, you get something which you can view as a threefold, a differential threefold, and it's diffeomorphic to the three sphere with a knot removed. It's a trefoil knot, so it's what I've tried to draw here on this picture. Uh, so it's, it's isomorphic to a, a knot complement here. And one cool thing that you could do with this is that this is a threefold that has a very natural flow on it. So there's a kind of, if you have a point, it, it traces out some kind of orbit. There's a flow on this threefold. And in particular, if you have a hyperbolic matrix, something in SL2Z, you can associate to that by some uh, precise procedure, which I've put here on the slides, uh, but won't say anything further about. 
an associated knot. And the point is that when you have a hyperbolic matrix with integer coefficients, this will be closed. So this orbit closes up and it's a periodic orbit. And this gives you a knot in this threefold minus the trefoil. And one natural question you can ask is if I have this trefoil knot and then this other knot coming from this hyperbolic matrix, they have a so-called linking number, which measures how, how often one winds around the other. You can ask, what is that linking number in terms of just data coming from the hyperbolic matrix? This is a question that Etienne Gis asked and answered, and it involves the so-called dedicant Rademacher co-sample. Okay, so I'll say something about that in the next slide. A second thing that you could do is you could take two hyperbolic matrices. This is analogous to taking two different CM points in the story of Gross and Zagier, which I'll get to in a second. But if you take two different hyperbolic matrix, they each define a knot, and you can ask about that linking number with each other. Okay, a very different problem. And Duke, Imamoglu, and Tov show that likewise, there's a similar object, mathematical object, a very concrete, but slightly mysterious thing called the Knopko cycle. And this Knopko cycle can be used to compute those linking numbers. Okay? So these are entirely topological invariants, which can be attacked by these algebraic things, which are these co-cycles, these elements of group cohomology somewhere. Uh, and in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip some of the following slides. I was going to say something more precise about what these co-cycles are. They're very concrete things. You can write them down with explicit formula and, and manipulate them explicitly, uh, but they're a little bit strange. Uh, that's, that's, that's it. So that's all I was going to say. I was going to tell you precisely where it comes from, but let me skip this. And let me just say for the dedekind rademacher co-cycle, the very classical object that came up in the work of Dedekind on the logarithm of the delta function, and is very closely related, therefore, to the weight two Eisenstein series, which is an Eisenstein series that's defined just outside the range of absolute convergence of the usual sum. And so it transforms like a modular form up to this factor, this 12C over CZ plus D. So it's, it's not quite modular, uh, but it, there's this error term. And this error term is really what gives them uh, the linking number. So let me just skip that. It's a cohomological thing. It's something in group cohomology that I don't want to say too much about, but it's a purely algebraic and explicit. Thing. That's what you should take away from it. Okay. All right. Then there's this Knopko cycle, which is a bit more important to our story. And this Knopko cycle, again, it's some kind of explicit, mysterious um, kind of um, expression, which we can manipulate algebraically. We can write down like this. And that is what we'll use later on to do an RM theory. And you see already an RM point shows up here. So the Knopf co-cycle is a co-cycle on SL2Z. So it's a map from matrices to certain functions, which I've written down here explicitly. And they're essentially sums of rational functions, 1 over Z minus W, um, but with some exponent, which is plus or minus 1. OK, and so here's a little drawing of uh, the intersection number of geodesics that comes into this exponent. So we take rational functions, 1 over Z minus W, weighted by some integer, which is 0 plus or minus 1. And it's defined in terms of certain intersection conditions of geodesics. Okay. All right. So I've put this here on this picture. Uh, and in a similar way, which I won't go into now, Duke, Momoglu, and Toff attack this topological invariant in terms of this purely algebraic object. Okay. All right. So that's sort of all I wanted to say about these linking numbers of knots. So the takeaway from this is that two topological invariants that have nothing to do with what we had uh, on the slides before, were attacked via these algebraic mysterious co-cycles that are very explicit. And that's just what I want to say um, uh, now, is that in our attack of RM theory, so an analog of theory of complex multiplication for real quadratic fields, what we're going to do is we'll start with the observation that, you see, we have the J in that. that we could evaluate it at CM points, which were imaginary quadratic arguments, and we got these nice algebraic numbers out. Now, the, the problem, if we want to generalize this to uh, real quadratic arguments, is that these arguments lie just outside of the domain of this function j of z, so-called rm point. So we can't evaluate j at this uh, rm point. And the reason is that, you see, if we're interested in real quadratic fields, by definition, infinity, which is the prime with respect to which we're working, because we have an, an infinity adic function, an analytic function, splits in k by definition of a real quadratic and the solution that we're going to come up with is that instead of working at infinity, we'll work with some finite prime p, which is not split in k, but rather inert. And by doing that, we have much more flexibility. You see, if we were interested in q of i, we're working with this h infinity, the usual upper half plane in CM theory, that's this entry. 
But for Q is joint square root of five, we can't do that because there are no points in the domain of this J function. But there are satisfactory analogs uh, over the periodics for every prime P of these uh, invariants. And so we have roughly half the primes to choose from. And so really the proposal is to work over periodic numbers, which were introduced to you in this nice course of Liang Chao uh, last week, where P is now inert in K. So it's as if it was imaginary quadratic, just because we're working with respect to P. Okay. And so without going into the details, what we do is we take these linking number ideas, which were about purely topological things, and we sort of upgrade this from SL2Z to this more interesting group SL2Z1 over P, and from rational functions to this more interesting meromorphic functions on the piatic upper half plane. So from this topological uh, motivation, we come up with two types of invariants corresponding to this dedicate Rademacher co-cycle and this Knopp co-cycle. Okay? The first ones were already defined in 2006, but in very different language by Darmon and Dasgupta. And they constructed piatic numbers, um, which we'll call J dedicate Rademacher of tau. And conjecturally at the time, these give you algebraic numbers, but they're not very rich like singular moduli. They're always P units. So to give you an, an example is that if P is equal to seven and tau is equal to this RM point that I've put on this slide, it gives you a root of the following degree polynomial which generates the ring class field in this particular case. But the interesting thing to note about it is that the leading term and the constant term are both powers of seven. So this number is not divisible by any other primes other than seven. So now this is actually proved. Uh, and so there's independent proofs, first one with Darmon and, and Alice Pozzi of this conjecture from 2006, and also of Dasgupta and Kakte, but the methods are extremely different. Uh, yeah, let me skip that. So in, in 2020, so very recently with Darmon, we take this Knopf code cycle, so the second type corresponding to the linking numbers of two different modular geodesics with each other, and they likewise construct piatic numbers, um, piatic invariants to a pair of RM points that appear to be good analogs of this quantity appearing in Grossman's language. Okay, so I was gonna convince you, but I, I see like I'm running out of time like crazy. So I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit fast and push to the last slide, which I'm very close to now. Uh, one thing, one point I want to make is that these are yeah. extremely. What's up? You, um, you have at least until four fifty, so you still have like five, six, seven minutes. Oh, okay. Did I start late? I was looking at the clock and sort of <laughs> being amazed at how quickly it goes. I'll, I'll try and finish within five minutes. Thank you. Oh, Thank you, you even a little more. You, you you have time. Don't don't worry. Okay, great. Okay, sorry about that. I, I uh, clearly uh, overestimated forty minutes. So what I want to say is that we we computed these. Um, Numerically, and the fact that we can do that reflects the explicit and concrete nature of these Knopf code cycles that we have before. So they're kind of explicit infinite products. And so in particular, these invariants that we have are very computable. So we can go to a computer and numerically test which numbers we get out. We get some piatic numbers, and they look up to some huge piatic precision like algebraic numbers. But important point to make about that is that it's by no means a proof, right? If you construct some piatic number and you suspect that it's actually a global number, uh, you haven't proved it by just computing to some uh, piatic accuracy, but you have very convincingly found it, okay? And here's a little table of some of these invariants um, that I've computed for you. The simplest case, so it's a piatic construction and it takes as input two RM points. The first RM point is one plus the square root of 13 over two, the second RM point, I'm going to vary over all of these things in the table here. So they're, in particular, they're going to be essentially the square root of two times some integer, some larger and larger integer corresponding to going deeper and deeper in the isogeny volcano that we had on one of the first slides. Okay, so we get larger and larger algebraic numbers conjecturally if this is an analog of singular moduli. And here I've tabulated some of them. And uh, if I had a bit more time, I would give you a few minutes to sort of stare at these. Once these have been computed, you can stare at them and try and find some patterns between them and relations between them. Uh, one interesting thing to note about them is that they don't seem to be algebraic integers, right? And this is a feature of this piatic theory that we never get algebraic integers. We always get things with denominators and there's a very good reason for that. The reason is that if you take the complex conjugate of these numbers, you should get their inverse, their multiplicative inverse. And that's just a feature of the theory. And this also is one of the reasons why we do not violate the EBC conjecture, right? Because if there were integers, uh, whenever you had something of class number one, we would run into that problem that we talked about in CM theory. 
Okay, so that's one thing to notice about them. Another thing to notice about them is that sometimes, for some weird reason, we just get one. So sometimes we haven't constructed an interesting algebraic number at all. Uh, one last thing, which is a little bit deeper, that I'll just point out to you now, is that there's this curious thing, because in Gross and Zagier, you're always working with respect to the prime infinity, which we could not change. Now we're working with respect to a finite prime p, for which we have some choice. Right? Remember, all we needed was that p was inert in these two uh, real quadratic fields. And so in particular, we have many choices of p. And here, for instance, I put in the table p equals 11, p equals 19, and p equals five, uh, 59, which are three acceptable choices that give us every time a different invariant attached to the same pair of RM points. Okay? So we have effectively a new variable in this theory that we could now also start changing. And what happens when you change this and you keep everything else fixed is the following. You see here, for instance, when p is 11, you get 59 in the denominator. 59 divides that invariant. And if you look at the 59 attic invariant, you get an 11 in the denominator. Okay, here's another one. 19 squared divides the 11 attic uh, invariant, and 11 squared divides the 19 attic invariant. So by introducing this new variable, we're observing this new phenomenon that there seems to be some reciprocity between the ord p, the p attic uh, valuation of the q attic invariant, and the ord q of the p attic invariant. They seem to be related in some way. Okay, we have a conjecture that addresses that, and so um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to finish very soon. I'm just going to put all the properties that we have of these invariants uh, in a direct comparison with what was happening in Gross and Zagier. So in Gross and Zagier, in summary. We start with two CM points, tau 1 and tau 2, which are in the upper half plane, right? And we consider the difference of singular moduli, which is an algebraic number. Gross and Zagier showed two things about them. The first thing is that they're related to a real analytic Eisenstein sound. Okay, that's what we had on the, on the first slide. The second thing is that if you take the Q-adic valuation of this infinite attic invariant, if you will, this can be phrased entirely algebraically in terms of intersections of certain embeddings in a quaternion algebra, which is ramified at infinity in Q. Okay, so some explicit algebraic uh, recipe for the or Q of this invariant. So in the RM story, it's very parallel. So now we're working with two RM points, but we're working not on the upper half plane. The second copy of the upper half plane has become a piadic version of it. And this group SL2Z times SL2Z has become SL2Z1 over Q. So the picture on the right has changed a little bit, but the statements on the left, that's the point I'm trying to make, are exactly the same. They've, they've just been formally obtained by switching infinity and P, formally. So what we do is we construct p adic invariants, which conjecturally, hence the question mark, are algebraic. Um, they're also related not to real analytic families, but to p adic analytic families. So again, formal switch of infinity and P. And we get a recipe for the ord Q of the p adic invariant in terms of intersection multiplicities of embeddings of these two real quadratic fields inside of the quaternion algebra ramified at P and Q. So again, formally swapping infinity and P. So the statements on the left are entirely parallel to each other, but the constructions are vastly, vastly different. Now, I just want to finish with one uh, kind of remark, which is if you look at this list, our construction is largely conjectural. That's why there are all the question marks. But one thing comes without a question mark. And that's the middle thing. And because these things, these invariants are so explicit, we can in fact relate them to piadic analytic families of modular forms, not conjecturally, we can prove it. We can prove that they are related to piadic analytic families. And the point I wanna make is that this can often be bootstrapped to proofs of the conjecture. So we can erase the question marks in many cases of interest and exactly how many, and if there are any restrictions really, it remains to be seen we're working on uh, checking the limits of this approach. And so I just want to finish by saying, uh, because we can relate these things to derivatives of piadic families of modular forms, we have a huge advantage, which is exclusively piadic and could not be done uh, when we're working with respect to infinity, in that piadic modular forms, piadic families of modular forms, are very intimately related to deformations of Galois representations. And those are ideas we've seen, for instance, in the talks of Jeremy Boer and David Savage. And using these techniques, which are something entirely piadic that is otherwise not available, we can inject some algebraic numbers back into the picture from before, and we can often prove some of these conjectures. And so I just want to mention that the first conjecture uh, about the dedicant Rademacher invariant, 
we can now actually show that there are p units in these extensions using deformations of Eisenstein series in rate one one. And then in ongoing work with Darmo and also Yin Kun Lee, we uh, can prove that this relation also implies certain algebraicity results, not for the full invariant, but for the invariant where we average over uh, the second choice of RM point over a fixed uh, discriminant. So we're hoping to push these methods further and actually uh, arrive at full proofs of some of the statements I made in RM. All right, so that's all I wanted to say. Um, and now is my favorite part, which is um, because I am lucky enough to be the final speaker in this conference. Uh, it is my big honor and pleasure to thank the organizers. And I hope you uh, join me in giving them a huge thanks. So here they are. This is Jennifer Balakrishnan, Keith Conrad, Alvaro Lozano Robledo, and Christelle Vincent, uh, all in action here, uh, as well as the very nice people at, at UConn who've uh, made this possible for a really fantastic CTNT. I just want to add that personally, I've been very impressed with how smoothly everything is run and how well they've made everything work in spite of the very, very difficult circumstances. And if I could take Alvaro up uh, on his offer of unmuting everyone, I think it would be very nice if we all gave them a huge round of applause for all the work they've done and this beautiful uh, conference that they've put together and summer school. So.